Well, listen, I'm real excited tonight. Um, boy, I'm real excited. Um, you know, I got to say this. During worship, the Lord was speaking to me. You really need to know that God makes all things new. I don't know who that's for, but that's for somebody. Because I get a sense in my spirit that there are, are things in your life that have been there a long time, patterns of, of life that you've lived in, and sometimes, although you know God is good, you know you've heard that a million times, man, let that sink into your spirit tonight, that he's going to make all things new, that your future's going to be new, Right? You know, a lot of times when you get free from something, the enemy tries to heap fear on you because he's like, well, you know what? You're, this is not going to be the rest of your life. You're going to get bound again. No. No, no, no. Whoever the son has made free is free. Okay? So things in your life that don't look like what the word says Zoe life should look like, Things that maybe have looked a, a wrong way in your life up to this point, your future is they're not going to look that way anymore. That God will turn that for you. And then he said this, and he, he was just talking to us specifically. You know, we talk a lot about what you say, about confession. Don't get caught into the ditch of confession. Thinking that, if I confess this enough, then I will have it and walk in it. Listen, you don't have anything that you confess because of the power of you speaking it. You only have it and it moves and changes because those words originated with God. Because they were God's word, he spoke them. And when you decide to agree with him and say what he said... The power in those words that he has spoken now can work in your life. So just as we get into this new series, we're going to talk about, I really feel very strongly impressed in my spirit to start a new series tonight on what, what it means. What is meditation in God's word? We're going to really talk about that and dissect some scriptures so that you can really understand because this is such a key. You must meditate in the Word of God day and night. The Holy Spirit is on the inside of you to teach you how to do that. But to, to do that, you have to understand. It's amazing if you look at the world's religions, how Satan has worked overtime with this meditation thing. But every other religion that meditates, they meditate in their mind which is the battlefield, which is Satan has access to your mind, right? No, no, we're going to talk about meditating in God's word, which is you meditate in your heart, but it will affect your mind, okay? So we want to talk about that tonight. Behold, he makes all things new. Hallelujah. So the reason why we're talking about this tonight Meditation in God's word, it's the only thing that will do this. It will move you from being a hearer of the word to being a doer of the word. Because only the doer is blessed, okay? Faith has to be released. You have to act on what you believe in order to walk in it, okay? But in order to be a doer of the word, you can't just suck it up and go, okay, I'm just going to be a doer of the word. Just like, do you know, like, when I was working out really heavy, I could bench 385 pounds. I was 15 pounds away from my goal of 400 pounds, right? And you know, if I went down to my gym and I put 385 pounds on that bar, right? It wouldn't matter how hard, how focused I was, how hard I really wanted to do this. 
if I could lift the thing off the bar, off the hook or whatever, right, I would be in big trouble because I can't start there because I've just, I've let those things slip. So when you talk about learning how to meditate in the word of God, we, I'm going to take all of us right back and we're just going to really talk about it from step number one. Because we got to lay precept upon precept. You and I are made to walk by the faith of God. You and I are made to live out of our spirit, to never allow the outside influence us. We're to walk and yield to the love of God. We walk in the very peace of Almighty God. We are continuously strengthened inwardly in the Lord by his strength kratos strength i mean everything we are now because now what's happened to us is we've been born again we are his child so when we talk about living a life of meditating in the word you're you're made to do it it's is that as a matter of fact it's it stinks to try to not do that right? Because you'll get in your mind, it gets confusing, there's inner turmoil, the enemy's stealing from you, you're not understanding things. But boy, when you make a decision, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to learn how to do this. I'm going to learn how to yield and meditate in the word day and night. Day and night. That's always. So when you think about that, man, you're like, well, pastor, we got to sleep. Yeah. Your spirit could still meditate in the word while you're asleep right? You could wake up instead of having nightmares and wake up worried, you could wake up with the word of God in your mouth, right? So meditation in the word of God, this is the foundational statement here. It, it will move you from being a hearer of the word to being a doer of the word, okay? It's, it's like it builds a bridge. As you meditate in the word of God, it builds a bridge for you so that you can walk going from being a hearer to being a doer. To meditate in God's word, so the main Hebrew v- verb we're going to look at tonight is it, it's pronounced ha ga. I'm sure I'm not saying that exactly right, but this Hebrew verb, it means to ponder, okay? It means to imagine, all right? It means to mutter, which, which means to speak, to mutter or speak. And it means to study God's word in your heart. When you are muttering or speaking the word of God over and over and over, Father, like you're, let's say you're in a situation in your life, and let's say it's just you're, you're concerned about, man, my life is always going to be the way it is here. This thing that's been bugging me, this thing that's been eating my lunch or keeping me back is always going to be there. And you start meditating in some of these scriptures about how that he makes all things new. About who, who the son hath made free is free. And as you keep muttering that and speaking that over and over out of your mouth, what's happening is down in your heart, you're pondering what you're hearing, right? You're pondering it. You're down in your heart, you're imagining it. You start to imagine it. And what you're doing as you're speaking is you are actually studying in your heart. That's, you could study this in your mind, have you ever heard somebody preach that really, man, they've got a lot of degrees and, and they'll sit up here and they could even quote a lot of scriptures, but it's like, dude, do you even know Jesus, right? Versus if you study it in your heart. So, so we're going to talk about that. So this, this process we call meditation in God's word, this is the process that causes your mind to be renewed, okay? This is very important. And, and if going back to a study on renewing the mind, you gotta understand how your, how your mind works. There's, there's levels that you gotta be careful of because Satan will throw thoughts 
in your mind. That's the first level of your mental life, in your mind. God will communicate his thoughts to you through his word, by his spirit, through your spirit, to your mind. Satan will throw thoughts from the outside. And then you, your subconscious mind, based on how you grew up or whatever, you will talk to yourself too. Well, we need to reprogram that. When you meditate in the word of God, what, what happens is God, through his word, by his spirit, will wean you off these detrimental thought processes. Like for me, the detrimental thought process that was beyond all of them in my life was you're worthless. So for some people, I'm stupid, or I'm a failure, or I'm just not, I'm not worth anything, or whatever that is, the word will wean you off of that to where all of a sudden you're like going, I can't even, I just can't go there anymore. That was just not even me. The reason why is it really wasn't you. Okay? Your spirit, do you realize as you're sitting here tonight, your spirit is whole. Your spirit is free. There is no addiction that your spirit ever could be touched with. So, but Satan knows the control center of your life is your soul, your mind, your will, and your emotions. So he will throw thoughts. And if you take a thought from him, right, all roads with him lead to death. Well, if you take that thought, well, how does he know if you take it? You speak it. Right? For me, I didn't walk around saying I was worthless. But the Lord showed me years later, it was like in a flash of time, he showed me all the way through, starting in about eighth or ninth grade, I would just say this constantly, and every year it would increase. This world would be a better place had I never been born. What, what am I saying there? I'm worthless. Why was I saying this world would be a better place as if, if I had never been born? Because that's what he was speaking in my mind. Right? And then he got me saying it too. Right? So when you take a thought, what happens? Now... These principalities, the, these demonic powers that are assigned against you that know everything that's ever messed up your whole lineage, they know your dad, your grandfather, your great-grandfather, your great-great-great-great-great, right? Your mother, your grandmother, they know all this. And they're, they're fishing. They're like, well, hey, that bait worked four generations ago. Let me try that, right? So if you'll take a thought and you start speaking it, now what these demonic powers will do is go, oh, great. So now let me keep these circumstances going. I got to keep them speaking. Why? So that I could build the second level. So that I could build this detrimental death thought into an imagination. Because your mind takes thoughts and builds an imagination. That's the way we're built. Satan wants to control your imagination. Because if he controls your imagination, he controls your life, your destiny. God wants his word to fill your imagination. So that you can see and observe to do all that's written in his word. So that you can walk in the very life of God. So now what happens if I... If I, if I keep speaking and then I start a behavior, I start acting on this thought. Now, as I act on the thought, the enemy will try to keep that behavior going so that you could build an imagination in your mind of that's, it's like a movie that's playing, that this is just the way I am. And so when that happens, now that's still not enough. He will continue to keep this going so that you will go, you will build the prison, or we call it a stronghold, which is the third level. So you, do you realize Satan doesn't build a stronghold in your mind. He gets you to do it. And, if, and, and this is the cool thing. If you have a stronghold in your mind, 
of some addiction or a behavior that's contrary to the word of God, it, it all is the same, just the facts are different. But do you realize as a Christian, there is one thing on the planet that when you implant the Amen. word of God in your heart, it brings wholeness and salvation to your soul. It, it goes in to your mind, your soulish realm, and uproots all those detrimental thought processes. So all of a sudden, you walk around saying, whoever the sun is set free is free. And then when that really goes off, and all of a sudden you go, whoa, whoa, time out. Wait, I'm free. So wait, I'm not doing this anymore. Right? It's almost like you just come to yourself. So this is why we teach this. We want God's word to be what, what fuels us. And that's why, listen, you can change everything in your life to look just like the word of God if you change the way you think. You have to change the way you think. You have to take thoughts captive with the word of God. You have to speak the word of God. See, this is why this, this en entertainment Christianity doesn't work. I mean, people go to church and they feel a little good about themselves, you know, for an hour and 15 minutes or two hours, but by that afternoon, it's over. And when the enemy's beating them up, they don't know, here they are born again, but they don't know how to combat that, right? You can't let, you just can't let the enemy, you can't give him an inch, he'll take your life, That's right. right? Meditation in God's word is of the heart or of your spirit, Okay. However, it has something to do with your mouth and it greatly affects and renews your mind. Okay? It's of the heart, but the mouth is involved and it's what it's what renews your mind. The Bible says you could change into an entirely different person by changing the way that you think. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm signed up in that class forever, right? So the purpose of meditation in God's word is to move you from hearing the word of God to pondering, imagining, muttering, speaking, studying in your heart the word of God until you see yourself being who the word says you are, being able to do what the word says you can do. That's the purpose. And it does that until you are actually doing it. You'll never do anything out here on the outside that you don't see yourself doing on the inside. And that's why we need to talk about this. And we're going to trust God for utterance, but I believe God's going to answer all of our questions and make this very simple, okay? So, let me say this again. The purpose of meditating in the Word of God, right, is to move you from being a hearer of the Word to being a doer of the Word, okay? And, and but be, in between there, you meditate in the Word so that what, what are you doing? I'm starting to ponder, imagine, mutter, speak, Study in my heart the word of God, right? I start to do that until I'm seeing myself being who the word says I am, doing what the word says I am, and I see that so clearly on the inside until I'm actually doing it and it's in my behavior now, okay? So get excited. This is a year of freedom, Right, And God wants you to walk in the freedom whereby he's already made you free. So we're going to really get into this. Meditation in God's word causes us to observe or see the word working in our life. Even when the outward circumstances are screaming another message. Okay? That's what God wants for you because this world system is designed to steal, kill, and destroy. It does that by creating an environment 
where there's unbelief and fear. Okay? Most people, what, how they're living is they've pulled the shade down over their life and are only imagining the facts of their life. And if they desire to have this, but they've pulled the shades down and all they could imagine are the facts of their life. And they actually look around and live. They're going, gosh, I really need this to happen. But as I look at my life, I see no evidence this could ever happen. And that's how believers are living. And that's not the walk of faith. Okay? When you do that, when you pull the shade down over your life, and you literally only imagine your life being what you can see, feel, taste, hear, smell, right? What happens, this leads to fear. That opens the door for fear, right? And ultimately defeat because it, it opens the door for the enemy to come into your life. And here's the cool thing, guys. You could, you could literally live your whole Christian life defeated and hear this and change all of that. Because the God of heaven, your father, Hello. told you, I'll always cause you to triumph. I'll always give you the victory. I'll never leave you. I'll never fail you. I'll never forsake you. And I'm doing all of this stuff because I love you with an everlasting love. It's such good news. So meditating in God's word, as I said, is something that you do between the time you hear the word and the time that you're doing it. Okay? So this is very, this is very important. So it starts with hearing the word. But you know, many believers don't hear the word. Many people who come to church don't hear the word. They just come and listen to it. So if you're listening to the word, you're never going to get there because you'll never meditate in it. So remember, we've talked about that. The listener of the word is like, okay, I'm hearing this, I'm listening to it, but I have no, my hard attitude is I, I'm not coming here with a willingness to do. I'm just hearing it. And I'll decide whether or not I want to do it. Right? That person, Satan doesn't, he goes on vacation. He could go lay at the beach. Because you're going to self-deceive yourself. You'll think you're in faith when you're not. Right? You'll, you'll be in a relationship or in a marriage and you'll think, man, that other person's the problem when you're the problem. Right? You'll think everybody else is your problem. And, right? I mean, you just get self-deceived. So the hearer, it, it begins by hearing. So many just listen to the word with no intention of submitting to the word, no attention, uh, just no decision in their life to apply it to their life. When you hear the word of God, you must hear the word of God with a willingness to submit to it and apply it to your life, no matter what it says. Because God's word, if he says it's life, it's life, right? Some hear the word with a willingness to submit and apply the word of God to their lives. However, they walk away and immediately start thinking about something else. Now, I'm not talking about the Episcopal Church down the road. I'm talking about Faith Family Church, right? I don't know anything. I've never been to one service there. have no idea what they do. That's between that pastor and God, right? But in our church, listen, guys, are you a little busy, right? You can get very distracted. So people come, and they hear their answer, and they're like, wow. That is my answer, and I, I have a willingness. Yes, I am sick and tired of living the way I'm living. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm hearing this. Lord, I'm willing to submit to it, and I'm going to apply this to my life, and then the service is over, and they start talking to people. They start doing this. They go to lunch. They, then they, start, they break their list out, and they got the 25 things they got to get done before tomorrow morning, and they forget. They forget so they never, they heard, but then they stopped hearing, and they never started meditating. How do you, 
How do you, like in James, how do you look and keep on looking? Hundredfold, 30, 60, hundredfold production of the seed of the word of God. Those that continue. How do you continue in the word? After you hear, now you start meditating. Right? And you start meditating in the word of God. That's why many times as you're reading your Bible, man, a scripture will jump off the page. Do you know how many times somebody in our church will come up to me and say, wow, pastor, this week the Lord was dealing with me about this scripture, and then you taught on it. Well, what is that? That's the Holy Spirit going, hey, I need you to meditate right here. And what people don't realize is, let's say that script, let's say that scripture's something to do with the love of God or whatever, but people are like, the enemy's sitting on their shoulders screaming, going, hey, that's great, but you got this problem. And we don't perceive that that scripture will solve this problem. Right? So remember, we work out what God's working in. We work out our own salvation with a reverence, honor, and respect of God above everything else in our life. So that way the Holy Spirit has a right to just lead us and guide us. So some will hear, but then as soon as the service is over or as soon as the message is over or as soon as they get up from wherever they're reading their Bible or whatever, they forget. They just So what is that person? That's just the discipline. That's how, that's how you just have to... The Holy Spirit will help you to get disciplined to where now you could have chaos going on the outside, but you're at peace on the inside. And you're still in that place where, he's, where, where you're meditating in the Word. Because when you start meditating in the Word of God, muttering it, speaking it, what happens is you start pondering it in your spirit. You start imagining things in your mind, right? Right? You start studying the word of God. You don't even realize you're doing it, but you're studying the word of God in your heart. And then pretty soon, man, when the Holy Spirit opens up that word to you, and now that light comes and it goes into your mind, now you start observing yourself doing it. And you'll observe yourself doing it until you're doing it. And that's how you walk by faith. Now there's some who hear the word with a willingness to submit to the word of God, a willingness to apply the word of God to their lives until they're observing themselves doing it because they leave, they leave and they never let it go. Listen, when you find an answer in God's word for your situation, don't let it go. Refuse to believe anything other than that being true. If he said every good and perfect gift is from above, I never have to settle. It's, it's done. I'm not settling. Right? It's, if it's not good and perfect, I don't want it. Satan will sit on your shoulder and go, yeah, but if you don't get it, what is your life going to look like? Come on. Or, or here, oh, you'll get it, but it's going to be like 30 years from now. Right? Why is he doing that? He always wants to take away hope. But when you are resolute with some of these things, it will change your life forever. So this is big. So let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 34. Deuteronomy chapter 34, we're going to start looking at verse 5. And I want to read through verse 10. This is a story about when Moses died and now Joshua is going to take over. And the, the scripture, Joshua chapter 1 verses 1 through 9 is some of the greatest teaching on meditating in the word of God. But I want to go back to Deuteronomy 34 and read up, up to this story here. You guys doing okay? Yes. It's going to be good. Do you know there's a giant inside of you? There's a giant inside of you. Deuteronomy 34, verse 5. It says, So Moses, the servant of the Lord, died there in the land of Moab, according to the word of the Lord. I mean, I think that's hilarious. Hey, Mo, you're 120 years old. I want you to climb that mountain and come. You gotta you got go up there and die, right? 120 years old, you can still climb a mountain. That's the way you want to live. And he, God, 
buried him in a valley in the land of Moab over against Beth Peor, but no man knows of his sepulcher unto this day. I think God did that because they would have worshipped Moses, right. right? And God doesn't want you looking at a man, right? right? I mean, follow me as your pastor as I follow Christ, bottom line, but you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus. So, and Moses was 120 years old when he died. His eye was not dim. Now that excites me. Because if God did that for him, he, he's no respecter of persons, right? Nor his natural force, in the Hebrew word, that word force means his natural strength abated. Nor his natural force abated. That word abated means fled. It meant at 120 years old, this dude, if you checked his blood, his testosterone's still about 1,000. He's, he's got vigor, he's youthful, he's strong, he's healthy, okay? Notice, notice he died when he was like that. Right? Now, I don't think we're going to have to deal with that physical death thing that way here. I have a feeling we're going to hear a shofar and just be changed. But if we are to live out our days, let's learn how to walk by faith so that when we get to a point, the Lord speaks to us and says, so, Tony, are you satisfied? Have you done everything down here? And I'm like, Lord, you know I have. He's like, okay, time to come home. And the Holy Spirit, through faith, will help me release. What did Jesus say when he died? He gave up his spirit. He's like, He's like, okay, enough is enough. I'm out of here. Right? I love that. And it says here, verse 8, And the children of Israel wept for Moses in the plains of Moab 30 days. So the days of weeping and mourning for Moses were ended. And Joshua, the son of Nun, was full of the spirit of wisdom. Wow. Joshua lived at the tabernacle. He was full of wisdom. Why? For Moses had laid his hands upon him, and the children of Israel hearkened unto him, and did as the Lord commanded Moses, and there arose not a prophet since in Israel likened unto, a Moses, likened unto Moses, whom the Lord knew face to face. Why did I read this? Because Joshua had some massive shoes to fill. And this is why we are teaching this, because you are Joshua. You have bigger shoes than Joshua had to fill. What are your shoes that you have to fill? Jesus, right? John 17, 8, or I'm sorry, John chapter 17, verse 18. We could just put that up on the screen. Jesus said this, as you have sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Do you realize that? In the same way, John chapter 20 in verse 21 said this, then said Jesus to them again, again. That means he said that to them more than this time. He said what? Peace be unto you as my father hath sent me, so I send you. In other words, do you think there's a call on your life? Yeah. As the Father sent Jesus, now Jesus is sending you. Wow, that's pretty big shoes, right? Let's go on. John 14, verse 12. Verily, very, verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believes on me, the works that I do shall he do also. Same works. But then he says this, and greater works than these shall he do because I go to my Father. And then here's the cherry on top of this. These are four verses you really should keep ever before you. Because Satan never wants you to find out who you really are in Christ. Because he wants you to read this and go, that's crazy, I can't do that. Well, of course you can't in your own strength. But you're not to do anything in your own strength. You're not even to do anything in your own ability only. Right? 1 John 2, 6, here's the cherry. 
He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. Why am I saying this? Because this is your bar. This is my bar. And we are well able. Jesus literally went to heaven and the Father sent another comforter, the mighty Holy Spirit, who now lives in you, and he is the one. He's your trainer. He'll stand by you. He'll strengthen you. He's your teacher. He does everything with you. He'll take you by the hand and walk you into this. I'm telling you, we're going to have a bunch of meditators in this church. And boy, I'll tell you, the, the fruit that it will bear, not only in your life, but in this church, in this city, in this state, in this country, and even around the world will be amazing. So now let's go to Joshua chapter 1, verse 1. Let's, let's talk about what God did. Now Moses is dead, so now he's coming to Joshua. It says in Joshua 1.1, 1, 1, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass... That the Lord spoke. You know, let me say this about, it always says Moses, the servant of the Lord. Do you know you are a servant of God as you minister to other believers and other, and other people in this earth? But you're never talked about as a servant when, when it talks about your relationship with God. You're not a servant. You are a child. Amen. Wow. Moses wasn't even born again. Right? It says here, he said in verse 2, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now, therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, unto the land which I do give them, even to the children of Israel. Promise number one coming up right here. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given you. As I said unto Moses, from the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, towards the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. Then he says this. So promise number one, he's like, guys, everywhere you walk, whenever you're walking on land, I have given that land to you. Wow. Promise number two. Now, doesn't that sound a lot like New Testament? Yeah. He's given us everything. Right? Promise number two, let's keep going here. It says, There shall not any man be able to stand before you all the days of your life. This word stand before, this phrase in the Hebrew, means no man will be able to position themselves in front of you to block you from going where I call you to go. So I've given you everywhere you taught, where you walk, promise number two, nothing can ever stop you. Nothing could, no earthly thing can block you from doing what I've called you to do. Wow. Why is that? Promise number three. As I was with Moses so I will be with you. Think about what that did to Joshua. Because Joshua was with Moses. Joshua was right there when Moses lifted his staff and, and God parted the Red Sea. Joshua was right there when the presence of God would come in that cloud of glory and talk face to face with Moses. Joshua was always there. He saw every day of his life, he saw amazing things happen, right? Promise number four, I will not fail you. That means I will never lose power or strength in my relationship with you. In other words, Joshua, you have access to all of my power and strength, and I will never, ever pull any of it back. It's all at your disposal. Wow. Not, but that's not, that's not the whole promise, number four. 
and I'll never forsake you. I'll, that means in the Hebrew language, I'll never abandon you and I'll never desert you. Wow. So think about that. Everywhere your foot treads upon, I've given you. Do you know it's the same for us today? That's right. Reach it. Wow. That's amazing. Nobody can stand before you and block you from doing whatever God's called you to do. Yes. And even in, in, in Isaiah 54, it even says, no weapon formed against you can prosper. Every tongue that rises up against you in judgment, you could condemn the tongue. Wow. As God was with Jesus, as he was with Jesus, so will he be with us. Amen. Right? As he was with Joshua, as he was with Moses, as he was with Elijah, all these, as he was with Paul, so he'll be with us. Wow. His power will never wane in your life. And he'll never leave you or abandon you. See, people might have abandoned you. You know, so many times people think they lose friends. You know, you don't lose friends. You just find out that they weren't your friend. That's it. Don't lose any sleep over that one. Because a friend will stick by you. Even when you're an idiot. That friend will be like, okay, I'll take the hits. I'm still in your life. Now, I might not be able to be around you, but whenever you're ready, I'm here. I'm, I'm here. If you need help, I'm, I'll help you. Right? But if somebody leaves you because of something that happens in your life, you mess up and they get mad and leave you, they were never your friend. Right? But God will never abandon you. He will never leave you. So, because of this verse, because of verse 5, now you can do verses 6 through verse 9. Notice how God tells Joshua all this stuff first. Right? Everywhere you go is yours. No man can block you. Right? My power will never wane. I'll never leave you or forsake you. I mean, as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. Right? All of these things, now because of that, Joshua, verse 6, command number one, be strong and of a good courage. For unto this people you shall divide for an inheritance the land which I swore unto their fathers to give them. Command number two sounds a lot like command number one. Only be strong and very courageous. I bet Joshua was kind of like, time out. I thought you said everywhere I go is, you've already given it to me. No man can block me. Your power is with me. You were, you're with me just like you were with Moses. You're never going to leave me. So why do I need to, why, why this focus on being strong and courageous? Right? It's the same thing. God's given us everything, but he's going to tell you, you got to be strong and courageous. Daniel 11.32 says, they that know their God will be strong. Right? So let's keep going with this. Only be thou strong, verse 7, and very courageous. Why? That you may observe to do. Observe, observe to do. Literally in the Hebrew language, it would read that this way. Be only be strong and very courageous so that you will observe yourself doing the word of God. See, if you're not strong and courageous in God, you won't observe yourself doing what the word says because you're you're going to be freaked out looking at circumstances, so you won't even see it. Do you see that? All right, let's keep going. Observe to do according to all the law. Okay, let's read that under the light of New Testament truth. We don't have the law, right? We have the word of God. So you could read it according to all the word of God, which Moses, my servant, commanded you. Here's command number three. Turn not from it, to the right hand, right, or the left, they would have all known that is talking about the right and left hand of wisdom. Don't turn from the law, or a New Testament believer, don't turn from the word of God and start looking at, at something like the right or left hand of wisdom. The right hand of wisdom is length of days and long life. 
The left hand of wisdom is riches and honor. God says, don't seek the stuff, you seek me. Right? Because that's how you position yourself to receive everything. And that's the game. Do you know that game was played with you today? All day long, the enemy was wanting, he was trying to train you to look at natural things because he wants you to make every decision of your life based on outward natural things. And you'll waste a lot of time and there's no satisfaction there because everything in the world changes, right? You might be doing great for a little while, right? You could even do great for 20 years. Then something happens, you forget what the good stuff in 20 years. You're up to here with what's going on right now, right? So here we go. Let's keep going with this. Hallelujah. Turn not from it to the right hand, for, to the right hand or to the left. Why? That you may prosper wherever you go. God wants you to prosper wherever you go. So you have to be, in meditating in the word, you're going to have to be strong and courageous so that you'll meditate in the word of God, so that you're meditating, and all of a sudden you start pondering, imagining, this is all observing to do. You're studying it in your, in your, in your spirit, in your mind. Why? Because you're muttering and you're speaking the word of God. You'll observe yourself doing it, and that will cause you to prosper wherever you go. Meditating in the Word gives you the ability to prosper wherever you go. Verse 8, command number 4. This book of the law, New Testament believer for us, the Word of God, shall not depart out of your mouth. God's Word always has to be in your mouth. Why? Because if it's not in your mouth, you're not meditating. And you know what? It could be in your mouth while you're doing other things. To be honest with you, the more you meditate, the more effective you will be in your natural life. Okay? So let's keep going with this. It shall not depart out of your mouth. The Knox translation of this part of this verse is wonderful. It literally says, let God's word govern your utterance. So how do you never let the word depart out of your mouth? Well, I, could, I mean, I can't come up and say hi to Mike because then I'd have to stop quoting scripture. No, no. No, meditating in the word is I'm allowing the word of God that's in my heart to govern my utterance. So, so why do I speak? I don't speak just to speak. I speak to put spiritual law in motion. So I'm always looking down on the inside of me on what to say. Because I understand I all have what I say. And I understand if I say what he says, I'll have what I say and he'll come to work on that thing. So I, what this, really focus on this, meditating in the word, never letting it depart from your mouth, means that you're allowing the word of God to govern everything that comes out of your mouth. Right? So if somebody asks you, you're believing God for healing or whatever, and they come up and say, hey, how are you doing? How are you feeling today? You know, believers in faith freak out about that. They're like, oh. I can't say what I feel. Immediately, I get a little concerned about that because I'm like, okay, you don't, you're not understanding something. But then, then down on the inside of you, all of a sudden you get a release. You know, Angela, I'm not, I'm not feeling really good, but you want, you want to know how, what I believe? I believe the healing power of God is working and affecting a cure because I'm healed. Amen. It's driving out all the sickness and all the disease. What do I say I say what I hear him say because I'm observing to do what's written in the word. It's governing my utterance. Okay, this is, this is a, that's a big thing. Command number five. But you shall meditate, ponder, imagine, mutter, speak, 
study in your heart, but you shall meditate, say over and over to yourself. Meditation, if you had a picture of it, it's disgusting, but it's a great picture. It's a, it's a cow chewing its cud. I, I never really understood what that meant, so I had to look that up, right? I remember when we moved out of Chicago when I was a little kid. We're driving down a country road. My mom's in the car. I'm in the back seat. My dad, my stepdad is in the front seat. I didn't realize it, but we're moving to, to hide from my biological father who was in the mob in Chicago, right? So I, I'm, just, I'm just a little kid. We're moving to a town of 500 people, Herrick, Illinois. The only grocery store in the town had a little hitching post out in front of it. Crazy, right? So, I mean, I grew up on the northwest side of Chicago, right? I mean, I would go to the Brookfield Zoo, but I never went there and looked at a cow. You go there and look at gorillas, giraffes, right? So I see this massive animal in a field. And I'm like, Mom, look at that thing. What is that? And my stepdad turns around and goes, you don't know what that is? I'm like, no, what in the world? He's like, um, that, that's a cow. I'm like, oh, well, then I knew what a cow was. But they chew their cud, so they eat their meal, then they throw it up back in their mouth, chew it some more, then they swallow it, and then they bring it back up and chew it some more. That's nasty. But that's meditation. You want me to say that like five or six more times? People will be like, got it, Pastor, got it. You got to speak the word, digest it, bring it back up out of your mouth. Keep, you're made to do that, right? But you shall meditate therein day and night. Why? That you may observe yourself doing all that is written therein. For then, then you shall make your way prosperous. What? In other words, God's word gives you the ability to make your way prosperous. Okay, let me burst the bubble of some of you. You know, now I don't think we have any of these in our church right now, but sometimes there's some carnal baby Christians that really think, man, they just know what everybody else needs to do. Uh, we don't really have that around here much, right? I mean, I had one guy come to church one day and he told me, man, he goes, hey, I've got a word for you. I'm a prophet. And, uh, you know, if you would stop shaving your, or you, you shaving your beard is the reason why your church isn't growing. And I'm like, well, I don't think I could grow a beard, but I don't really know because I can't stand whiskers. I actually shave like twice a day. I just can't, ugh, right? I, that's just who I am. So I'm like, and, and by the way, dude, our church is growing. So thank you for that word. Do not, I told him I don't receive it, right? That's ridiculous, right? But, but the word of God as you meditate, now, now get this. God's not going to speak to you. I'm Courtney's pastor. God's not going to speak to me and go, go tell her she's got to do this for her life. Yikes. No, 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 no. That's ridiculous. Because the word is a lamp to her feet. My, the word I get is the lamp to my feet. Right? When you meditate in the word, you will get the ability from God through his word to make your way prosperous. Does that make sense? Yeah. All right. So now let's go on. To meditate, it means again to mutter, to say over and over to yourself. Right. So meditation has something to do with your mouth. Remember we said that. And here's another thing about meditating in the word of God. You must do your own meditating. Nobody else can do this for you. We meditate in God's word. Why? Because faith is of the heart. You must meditate on God's word so that you are operating out of what you believe on the inside, right? Instead of just being moved on the outside and trying to make something work on the outside. You meditate so that you're living out of what you believe on the inside and you're, just, you're not just trying to make something work, okay? 
And, and if you ever step out, th this is, have you ever seen somebody do this or have you ever done it? Don't raise your hand. You know, nobody will know. But you know, you, you're just like, oh, you know what? God told me to go do this. And, and that was just you trying to figure out what would work. And then it doesn't work out, right? We, we've had people leave the church and sometimes they're like, yeah, God told me to leave. Okay, okay, well, you leave with our blessing. What, what did God tell you to do? Oh, I don't know. Okay, that's like a little flag, you're right. But, but I always tell people, I'm like, man, you leave, leave with my blessing, come back, stay in relationship with people here. You're always welcome to come back and visit. And if you, if you find that you don't find what you're looking for out there, come back and act like you never left, Amen. right? I'm so glad that I, that I had a pastor in California that helped me that way. Because we all miss it. But what's worse than missing it is missing it and then getting into pride and never being willing to go, oh yeah, I miss, I just messed that up. You know, that doesn't hurt to say that. Right? Yeah, I miss God. Right? Whatever. Well, what will people think of me? Listen, most people have, are kind of up to here with thinking about themselves. If they're carnal right? They will be way up to here. If they're spiritual and they're not thinking about themselves, they would never judge you anyway. So don't worry about it, right? God's word, as we've said many times, and this is with meditating, God's word is transformative. As you meditate in the word of God over time, it transforms your life. It's, it has a cumulative effect on your spirit as you stay in the word and you keep speaking the word, I mean, every moment of every day, you get stronger and stronger. And all of a sudden, some areas of your life that seemed a little confusing and dark will just get light. And all of a sudden, you'll go, oh, okay. I mean, it's really amazing. God's word gives you the ability to make your way prosperous. Why do you have to make your way prosperous? Because when a mountain comes, does, does Mark eleven twenty three 23 say to speak to God about your mountain? No. It says to speak to the mountain. So how do you make your way prosperous? See, when I'm meditating in the word of God and Satan comes to try to do something, oh, wait a minute, time out. No, I reject those symptoms. I, I reject that whole deal, right? Now, we don't, if, if a doctor diagnoses you with something real serious, don't jump in his face. I reject that. That's... No, no, thank him. Thank you, thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Appreciate that. But when you leave, Father, I reject that because I've been redeemed from the curse of the law. Amen. Right? You might have to look at your checkbook and go, I reject that. Right? All those bills, you got to grab them and go, Father, you got mail and I call them a paid. So, so that's you make your way prosperous. Verse 9, have I not commanded you? Command 6. Sounds a lot like it said a couple other times. Be strong and of a good courage. Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. See, you could be afraid of something, but then if you ever get dismayed, that means you're scared. That means you're like, you could be afraid somebody's going to break in your house, but then all of a sudden you hear somebody prying open the front door and, and that you can go to dismayed really quick, right? For the Lord thy God is with you wherever you go. Isn't that good news? Josh, listen, I'm here to tell you. Be strong, of a good courage. Don't be afraid. Don't be dismayed, because I'm with you. New Testament believer, listen, I'm with you. Don't, don't worry that maybe you mess this thing up a little bit. I'm bigger than that. I'm going to get you to the other side. Just grab hold of it again. Give yourself a break, right? That's what God would say to you. God speaks to Joshua. Listen, Josh, I'm going to give you everything I gave Moses. I'm going to do everything for you that I did for Moses. I'm going to be with you. I'm not going to fail you. My power's never going to wane. I'm never going to abandon you. And because of this, Josh, you be courageous. You be strong. See, a person who is not strong and courageous and who doesn't meditate in the word of God 
will never be able to do the word. Well, I just got to stop lying. Uh, this addiction, I just got to, I got to stop it. Come on. The road is not trying to suck it up and stop something. You're already free from it. So you got to get in the word. You got to get in the word and build the word of God in you so you find out who you really are in him and what he's given you and who he is in your life. This is a key passage about meditating in the word. Notice, God tells Joshua three times to be strong and courageous. In verses five through seven, he commands Joshua to be strong and courageous. In verse eight, Joshua, God tells Joshua how to be strong and courageous. And then verse nine, he repeats the command again and he says, be strong and courageous. You must be strong and be very courageous to do the word, right? So I'm going to, well, shoot. I'm just going to read this. Just, I'm going to touch on this real fast. Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10. Look at what it, let me pull this into the New Testament. In Ephesians chapter 6, verse 10, it says, finally, now that means now to the most important thing I'm going to say to you. That Greek word means now to the most important matter at hand. Be strong. Finally, my brethren, be strong. This word means, it's first of all, it's in the commanded tense. God is commanding us as New Testament believers to be continually strengthened inwardly in the Lord. And this is written, in the Lord is written in the locative tense. Be strong. This word strong also means superhuman strength. But it's in the Lord. It's in the locative tense, which means superhuman strength is only found in the Lord. It's never found in you. Okay? Be strong in the Lord and in the power of this is the Greek word kratos. This means power and dominion and strength in the power of his might or his ability is what that word might means. God is saying you be strengthened inwardly continually with superhuman strength that is found only in Christ. It's a, it's a strength that is, it, it produces strength in you and dominion. It strengthens you to walk in your dominion. So many people are trying to talk to Satan and get these little demons out of their life without submitting to God. They're just trying to resist the devil, and, and the devil will laugh at them. That's right. Every right? So, so we, you're strong in him. We are to live victoriously in this present evil age in spite of any satanic oppression. How? Through God's ability, strength, and power. But to be strong, you're going to have to live in him. You already are in him, but you have to live in him. Our weakness is not ever an issue. Have you ever had something in your life you're just going, I, I can't do it. I can't break this. Your weakness is not an issue if we're drawing on the divine power, strength, and ability of God. The way we keep this command, how do we keep this command? By meditating in the word of God day and night.